Well, greetings to the the live chatters and everyone else watching out there. This is Walter Bosley of the Walter Bosley channel. And uh, today is the day before Thanksgiving here in the United States, of course. And uh, I know a lot of folks are either on the road getting where they're going to be for the holiday weekend or they're there already and enjoying their time with their families, and I hope you all have a good uh, holiday weekend. This is one of my favorite holidays, not just because of food, um, but, uh, well, primarily this is a food holiday, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what's not to like? Anyway, um, this also today happens to be the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And um, that's being discussed in a lot of places, as it should be. And uh, we're going to um, get into that from the Walter Bosley perspective, so to speak. And not just my perspective, but my perspective on particular perspectives, right? I guess you could say that. So let's start with... the beverage. This one's a, wait a minute, getting used to the position of the camera, a Celsius Oasis vibe in the Miskatonic University mug. You Lovecraft fans will appreciate this. I got this mug at um, one of the Lovecraft Film Festivals in San Pedro. And you can get this at the uh, HPLHS shop online, the, the uh, HP Lovecraft Historical Society. If you recall, the two guys um, were uh, that, that started it, they um, were guests of our friend Cardinal Sin, and I was on there, and and uh, that was a great conversation. And, and soon, uh, Malia and I will be going to Pasadena to visit their location. But you can get these Miskatonic University, Miskatonic University mugs from them. This is one of their products. And there we go. That has, in the past, been the kickoff two episodes here at the Walter Bosley channel. So uh, I want to start out also, this is a holiday weekend, but it's also a big cinema weekend. And the biggest reason that uh, I recommend is the Napoleon film uh, directed by Ridley Scott starring Joaquin Phoenix. And uh, what better time to get your copy of the esoteric Napoleon secret missions four by Walter Bosley. And uh, this is considered a favorite among my readers. And uh, it probably is one of my best books so far. And uh, there's more to come on this research, of course. But this is, um, this is the weekend that the big Napoleon picture has opened. It's opened already. And uh, we will be seeing it over the weekend, and I will uh, be doing a review on here um, after that. So there we go. The Esoteric Napoleon. Go catch the Napoleon motion picture this weekend playing in a theater near you. Now, um, much like the writing of the Nimza book, my most recent book, uh, this discussion is not something that I ever look forward to because, quite frankly, I do find it depressing. Um, I do doubt that we will recover um, fully from what appears to have been a coup pulled with the JFK assassination. Now, the setup for the coup, the um, what I consider the invasion of the United States was through Operation Paperclip, in my opinion. Now, on this issue of 
who the Nazis are, um, who they really were, rather who were their benefactors, right? Their godfathers. I entered that discussion with this book back in 2013. When I made the, um, what I consider the Etta Place discovery with the Cora Stanton mystery, that brought in certain players which tied to um, Germany of the 19th century, Prussian Germany, and then, you know, unified Germany. And uh, that brought in the mysterious German group which Charles Delshaw tells us was called NIMSA, okay? And I discussed uh, the, the, the German connection to this mystery um, in this book through a NIMSA 19th century context. Well, as I pulled more threads, um, two years later, I reveal those threads or Sorry about that, guys. I guess yellow is close enough to green that this doesn't really show up right. But this is my book, Origin. As you can see, it usually has a yellow cover on there. Um, I flesh out this Nimza, this mysterious Nimza, who I think Nimza actually was and what it was, and how the threads go from the Sonora Aero Club period, actually before that, the early 19th century, um, all the way through the 1890s airship mystery and into the 20th century, pre-Nazi era. And, um, you know, I talk about, well, there's Colonel Samuel Tillman, who you hear dark journalist, our friend Daniel List, talk about within the context of the Cosmos Club. That's him right there. And, um, he is at the, really, the center of the 1890s airship mystery, but also, by extension, um, in this whole mystery about this, what we call breakaway civilization, what I prefer now to call breakaway society, um, NIMSA. Okay. So my research between these two books was to try to flesh out Del Shell's NIMSA. Okay. And these two books mostly stuck to the 19th century presence, what I think was the 19th century presence. That's another thing here at the Walter Bosley channel. If you're new, um, what you get here is I admit when something is, uh, is an hypothesis. Okay. Um, I tell you that this is something I think. All right. Um, if I'm certain about something, I specify that, Hey, on this particular case and you know, in my books, I provide the footnotes and stuff, but uh, I like to be honest and, and say, hey, these are the things I think, okay? Just like, you know, a lot of people get in trouble with the whole Hanabu saucer thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was real. That was real. Well, no, it wasn't. First of all, the Hanabu saucer thing was, it's bullshit. It was post-war neo-Nazi propaganda bullshit that became popular lore in the UFO enthusiast community. And um, it never was anything more than uh, a story, okay? It, it has never been proven. So um, that's just an example, you know, rather than say, hey, we think the Nazis might have had this. People are saying, oh, no, no, they definitely had it. Don't you know that's been proven? Well, that's been proven about as much as the ET hypothesis has been proven for Roswell. And it has not. So anyway, for those of you who are new, um, I'd like you to know that, that I, that I'm honest when it's just something that I think, and these books, um, are what I think about the mysterious German based NIMSA through the 19th century leading into the 20th century up to the pre Nazi era of Germany. But a lot of people asked me, okay, but, but who, who would they be now? Who would they have been during World War II? Did they disappear during World War II? And I don't think they did. I think um, they were 
one of the strong, major, you know, top two or three influences that helped, um, uh, uh, that really helped <clears throat> the Nazis exist, really. You know, the Nazis existed because of the, um, the ground that organizations like the mysterious NIMSA had, had broken and laid out for them. Okay. In other words, the Nazis couldn't have risen to power, in my opinion, without the influence of NIMSA and, you know, one or two others. But I focused on NIMSA. So being asked about that, um, you, you know, I had some ideas. I wasn't sure. It was a good question because I didn't know. I had not pulled the threads that far um, and I had not pursued the research that far. But I knew that I had to eventually. So it was um, in a discussion with our friend Joseph Farrell that um, led me to a couple of books that if you're, you're interested in my sources for this book, okay, my newest one, um, I recommend that you read. And they are first... The Thousand Year Conspiracy by Paul Winkler. And then I also recommend you read the book Perfidy by Ben Hecht. In fact, today, these, in, in, it, it, it's quite pertinent, the Ben Hecht book. I would uh, strongly recommend that book. Ben Hecht, by the way, H-E-C-H-T, was probably... Uh, I, I believe he's considered one of the top three screenwriters of all time. Um, he's almost up there with Herman Mankiewicz. Uh, but Ben Hecht wrote the screenplay for Gunga Din, the, you know, the great 1939 adventure, 1939 adventure film, and, and several others. But in the 50s, he wrote this book, Perfidy, um, which sheds more light on... Um, World War II and post-war uh, Nazi influence, Nazi power, and uh, such related matters, and how their existence continued after the war to influence politics and, and such. Um, but uh, mostly, I don't really go into perfidy in this book. I do go into the thousand year conspiracy. Now I was recommended that book, the thousand year conspiracy, um, some years back and I read it. You guys have heard me talk about it. I've, I found it to be a very depressing book because this is a book that was written in 1937, but not published till at least here. Or I, I think at all till 1943. Okay, now here's the troubling thing. Two troubling things about this, this book, The Thousand Year Conspiracy by Paul Winkler. Number one, there's no footnotes. Okay. That's unfortunate. However, when you read it, if you know your medieval history, and stuff, it, the, the book totally makes sense and rings true. Now, here's, here's the other disturbing thing about it is that one of the other disturbing things is that um, reading it from our 21st, you know, or any kind of, actually any post-World War II perspective you get on the Winkler book, The Thousand Year Conspiracy, you're going to understand, uh-oh, he may not have footnoted it, but looking back, we know that the history he's laying out is accurate, is true, okay? What he wrote was a warning about Nazi Germany specifically, you know, the Nazi party and that whole movement. And through his knowledge of medieval history, specifically the Prussian Junkers, look them up, um, and their involvement with the Teutonic Knights and all that, what he shows was this pattern, this formula that the um, Prussian Junkers used um, to great effect. Okay, in um, uh, attaching themselves to a host, so to speak, a political host, what have you, 
uh, a national host, whatever, and ingratiating themselves, using that host to feed on, to build their own power, okay, through an in, in influence. And then when they're done using that host, they make friends with that host's enemy. Sometimes an enemy that wasn't an enemy, an enemy that they stirred up, okay? There's, there's a lot of duplicity in this group we're talking about, these Prussian Yunkers. And um, they used the Teutonic Knights to rise to power, and then they helped destroy the Teutonic Knights, okay? And they learned that, hey, this works. So this became their formula, okay? And they started doing it within the Prussian states. And then when Germany unified, which by the way, they were very much a part of unifying Germany because their vision was always world dominance. And then once they did this throughout Germany and got control of Germany, then they started, you know, hey, let's do it throughout Europe and then throughout the world, right? And uh, if you're familiar with um, Halmer Schock, and his method of Germany invading through commerce and industry. In other words, spread German companies, commerce, and industry to other parts of the world, okay? Establish your little industrial colony to support that commerce, but use the resources, gain political favor, do what you can to get control of that other territory. Okay, and then through duplicity, take just take total control. Okay, either behind the scenes, you know, through political influence or overtly, you know, what have you. Well, shocked. This wasn't something shock dreamed up. This is essentially the formula that the medieval Prussian Yunkers used. So, this particular culture, the Prussian Yunkers, um, then you know. German Empire Reich's kind of uh, culture, leading right into the Nazi era, okay? Um, the, 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 this has been essentially an unbroken thread, and now right up into our times, how they do this, this method, this formula of invasion and then taking over um, and preferring to do it you know, as much behind the scenes as possible. Well, in reading the Winkler book, I saw this is, they did this to the, to the United States um, through Operation Paperclip. Think about it. Um, everybody, uh, oh, not everybody, a lot of people think or assume that Operation Paperclip was all about the bomb. No. It was started by, and it was mostly about aerospace medicine, aerospace engineering. Essentially, what does that mean? Putting man in space, all right? And it was the idea of the German aerospace medicine scientists. Yep, they were the ones that went to Colonel Harry Armstrong and, and um, gosh, I forget the, uh, I don't think it was Hap Arnold. Anyway, uh, and went to him and said, hey, we can bring you like like 58 or something like that of these guys, and it'll be good for America. Get us to America and such. And you guys know the story of Operation Paperclip. And out of this grew our uh, military industrial complex, okay, via greatly the pursuit of a space program. Our space program resulted from the influence of these Nazis, former Nazis that we got, you know, or allegedly former Nazis that we got through Operation Paperclip. Anyway, I saw that as I was reading the Winkler book, I realized, oh my God, they did this to us. And a lot of stuff fell into place, okay? There's people out there that can't stand to hear the, the you know, Joseph Farrell talk about the post-war Nazis and the Nazi international. Oh, I don't wanna hear that, I don't wanna hear that. Well, you know, you've heard me say it, tough titty, okay? It matches the facts better than anything else, like it or not. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, we have that in our community. We got people just, they, they want to hear what they like. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear their pet theories. Well, 
there's those who peddle in pet theories, and then there's those who, you know, discuss what they think it actually is, okay, based on their research. And that's what I try to do here. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't cater to the pet theories. You know, I, I haven't thought Roswell was an ET event for several years. Okay. Anyway, so it was very depressing. I started to do a little video. Didn't want to do it. I set it aside for a few years, but finally I kept being asked and I thought, you know what? I need to follow the thread up to today. And that's what this book is. Okay. You can get this at walterbosley.com. That's where the, you know, the link will take you to get this book. This is my latest. See, it's not very long. I try to get to the point. And that's why we're discussing this book today. Because, yes, I in, I, I, I in, I'm in that uh, school of thought, that camp that um, agrees, thinks, believes, whatever you want to say it, however you want to say it, that um, the one suspect in the JFK assassination that had its connections to all others, to all motivations for JFK to be eliminated are the post-war Nazis are that Nazi international of Joseph Farrell are the um, operation paperclip Nazis who helped, who, who envisioned um, what our military industrial complex could be and greatly made it happen. And unfortunately we're controlling it. Okay. Um, and had influenced American industrialists, and American politicians and some American military leaders to believe that an American empire should be the objective. Um, they used the threat of the Cold War, the spread of you know Soviet communism, as a motivator uh, through fear, um, and then they used that uh, policeman of the world stuff on us to get us to be revved up in a bunch of rah-rah and believe that, you know, this was a good cause to spread American empire. Um, but it was really all about strengthening our military industrial complex and putting man in space. You see, um, as you guys know now, okay. Um, there, the, the, Industry in space brings with it some rather potentially politically sinister things. Like the other day, um, uh, dark journalist Daniel List was talking about what corporations see as a benefit for being in space. And that is an interpretation of law as... Well, the law applies to businesses on Earth. If we're doing operations and we're based off planet, then we could interpret that certain laws don't apply to us. You think that's fantasy? Take a closer look. Okay. Um, the secrets of what's out there. Sure. You know, Americans say, well, our tax dollars pay for NASA and everything they do belongs to the people. And we have a right to that information. Um, meanwhile, private entities, corporations, that's what corporations are. They're, they, they don't belong to the public, you know, the way government um, uh, efforts belong to the American public here in the States or other such nations. Um, they go out into space and anything they find belongs to them. It's theirs. They don't have to tell us what they've found. They could find relics of past civilizations out there and not say a word about it. So, um, then there's the whole issue of, uh, uh, finance. Now, again, I refer you to 
Joseph Farrell and uh, Daniel List and um, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz uh, for the discussion of finance and space. Okay, because they're the experts on that discussion. But you see, this was the vision of the Operation Paperclip Nazi Luftwaffe aerospace medicine scientists since before Nazi Germany. You see, Colonel Harry Armstrong and all the American aerospace medicine specialists, they knew these guys, okay, from their profession, from their pursuit of putting man in space pre-war. They knew a lot of these guys. They were familiar with them on a personal level and especially their work. See, this dream to put man in space, yeah, this has been going on for a lot longer than post-World War II. Okay? Um, so, this really appears now to be what it was really all about. Get them in here. Because the United States was the sleeping giant, right, at the beginning of the war. And we became the industrial powerhouse that won that war greatly, okay? Um, so naturally, they looked at us and said, oh, they're about ready to kick our country's ass, you know? So they're the next perfect host. Let's just attach ourselves to them. How do we do it? We got to get in through a Trojan horse. Operation Paperclip ended up being that Trojan horse. It was their idea all along. And um, it, it, it has worked. They got in here. Um, they had the second half of the 1940s and all through the 1950s to build their little American industrial, military industrial complex empire. Okay. And uh, things were, were, were going great. Uh, they were also fanning the flames of the Cold War. And um, now don't forget and don't get me wrong. There was at the same time a Soviet Marxist communist um, uh, international, so to speak. And they were pursuing much the same effort. And both these entities we're getting much use out of the United States after World War II, okay? Um, you had several Americans um, who were in positions uh, to uh, illegally share our classified military technology with the Soviet Union, all too willing to do that. And um, the post-war neo-Nazis, of course, these were their rivals for global dominance, right? So they didn't like it at all. And uh, so when we get to JFK and the discussion that he was preparing to share our space program with the Soviet Union, okay, to do a joint mission, as we know, this was discussed in just days before the assassination. It was the final straw. JFK was doing all sorts of stuff that was pissing off the empire builders. And there was no way that these America-embedded neo-Nazis were going to stand for their host sharing access to space with the Soviet Union so readily as JFK wanted to do. So... There you go. You know, they were concerned that JFK doing that would really impede, if not destroy, their big empire that they were building, their military industrial complex that they had envisioned and use our, used our resources to build here for the United States. Which, folks, um, as I say in the book, it never really has been our military industrial complex it's been theirs okay because they they certainly i think look at it that way that it is theirs now the assassination of jfk was the big move and you a lot of people pointed out as a coup and that's 
pretty much what I think it was. That was the coup. And if you look at American political history, okay, and military industrial complex history, after the JFK assassination, okay, you have uh, the, the, the social chaos that followed through the 60s and a fair portion of the 70s. Okay, this this kind of thing, this social chaos, that's a product of MK Ultra tactics. Okay, um, and and was long. I, I mean, I, I say it it even predates MK Ultra as such. It goes back to the days of Zerzinski. Okay, Zerzinski was the Soviet um, uh, uh, counterintelligence spy master guy who who really. Um, you know, he came up with a lot of, a lot of these tactics. And, you know, I, I think the Germans, the Nazis went to school on Jerzynski. Okay. Um, because a lot of the kinds of things that Jerzynski, um, envisioned that the Soviets could do to infiltrate and, um, uh, sabotage, okay. The West, you know, uh, their enemies, the UK, the United States. These were the kinds of things that um, totally resonated with, rhymed with the kinds of things that the German scientists and psychiatrists who developed what we call MK Ultra, um, they had been working on for years. Okay, and by the time the, of the World War II era, by the time of you know us getting our hands on what we call MK Ultra. And it was more of a, I guess, a tactical method for really bringing about or being able to bring about the kinds of infiltration that the Soviet Zerzinski envisioned, okay? Um, and the 60s and much of the 70s in the United States you can see that in the social turbulence and the chaos, the, the assassinations, the serial killers, the, the lone gunman, you know, assassinations and such. And, uh, you know, then we had kind of a, um, a, a, a respite, right, during the uh, Jimmy Carter years in the U.S. But then with Reagan, the... Um, the What's the word I'm looking for? The creation, the political creation of this Nazi international, okay, is what we call the neocons. They are a product of this Nazi international influence. They are, they are a product of the coup that was the JFK assassination. And they latched themselves onto the Reagan campaign, okay, like a lamprey onto a whale, okay, a sucker fish. Um, remember, Reagan did not want George H.W. Bush as a running mate. He was kind of forced on him. And George H.W. Bush, you know, he's the, uh, the, the, the beginning of that Bush political dynasty. You guys know all about that. Um, I call them neo-Nazi guns. Okay, because that's essentially, they were all about the military industrial complex empire at any cost. Okay, they have been all about war, war, war. Okay, yes, I am a military officer, reserve, inactive. Um, but I'm not one of those that thinks war is a willy nilly thing we should be doing just because we feel like it or just because it'll boost our economy. Okay. You don't do something like war for those reasons. It seems like the United States in the last 30 some years has, has done that, but you're not supposed to, but that's the exact kind of thing. Okay. That we can look at um, when we're looking for evidence of, you know, a JFK assassination coup having happened in 63, 60 years ago today. So you see from that perspective, when you look at it that way, 
this stuff makes more sense than anything else as an explanation. Now, the use of terror is another tactic, okay? The Prussian Junkers, the medieval era, Prussian Junkers, they had this organization called the FEMA, F-E-H-M-E. -E. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but people have noticed, hmm, sounds like FEMA, right? Anyway, uh, the FEMA, 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 whatever. They were this notorious organization, very secretive, who used terror and assassinations to keep politicians and society in line, according to their vision. The JFK assassination uh, fits the FEMA mold exactly. It's exactly the kind of thing that they would do. And the uh, politicians of the medieval era would refuse to comment on this. They were afraid to. They just, let's not discuss it. Here's another interesting thing. In the medieval era of, in, in the post-medieval era of this FEMA organization, um, any, get this, any documentation or records having to do with their uh, activities were not discussed. And some of them, to this day, centuries later, remain classified and secret and sealed away. German citizens today cannot get them and read them. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that sound familiar? Documents related to assassinations just indefinitely kept from the public. Wow. But I know there's some of you out there, um, you, uh, you skeptic guys who have a certainty fetish um, afraid of any kind of intellectual commitment to anything, you know, like this, uh, you'll say, oh, it's just a coincidence. Oh, it's just similar. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it, it's exactly what they did during the medieval era through this, this organization. And so there's really, in my opinion, no other conclusion, but that What happened 60 years ago today was indeed, as others before me have been saying for a long time, a post-war Nazi coup. Now, NIMSA, the organization we first hear about through Charles Delshaw, and the organization that I have fleshed out in three books, I think that when people ask me the question, who do I think NIMSA is today? Okay. That's who I think they are. I think they're the, the Nazi international that Joseph Farrell is referring to, or at least the Nazi international that Joseph Farrell refers to is a, is a close associate. Um, and to some extent, probably um, an apparatus of NIMSA, whatever they really are, whatever they are today. Okay. And, um, yeah, if you, if you haven't read this, WalterBosley.com, it's my latest book. Um, there's, it, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's kind of taking off. Um, there's a lot of people, um, wanting to read this book and, and several who have, who've got it already. So um, I would, uh, in light of today and the, the various hypotheses that are out there about the JFK assassination and, and when, you, when you, you know, watch other discussions on this today and tonight, you know, ask yourself, you know, what, what was the background of this Nazi coup in America in 1963, okay? Well, this is what I've done with my research, okay? This is the background of the rise of Nazi Germany. These books right here, I lay it out for you. Okay. It wasn't, and, and I do it through the technology. Okay. I was able to show that the rudimentary proof of concept model of the Nazi bell 
was being built in the 1850s, according to Delshout. And there's a, an illustration done. Uh, let me show this to you. That Charles Delshout uh, laid out prior to 1923, folks. Okay. There you go. The Nazi bell. Let me get that up there. That is what Charles Delshaw claims the Sonora Aero Club was using in the 1850s. And when you look at it and you read what's on there, it is the Nazi bell of the 20th century. They didn't, I, I have a video here at the Walter Bosley channel. Scroll through my videos. Okay. And it, it says Walter has an issue with the Nazi bell, something like that, the, the title. Please go check it out because it shows you that. Um, I think the bell was real, whatever it was, but it shows you that the Nazis did not get the bell from any ridiculous downed ET saucer. That's bullshit. Okay. That, that, it's just bullshit. All right. Um, the bell is something that was being developed, you know, as I, as I point out, as I found a hundred years almost a hundred years before the rise of Nazi Germany. Okay. And, um, you look at what was being done in with thermodynamics and, um, with, you know, engineering of turbines and such. And you see that there was a very human thread of research leading up to whatever the Nazi bell was. They didn't need, okay. Little ETs crashing on earth to back engineer anything. All that is, is the bullshit lore that goes with the bullshit Hanabu story. Um, don't mean to burst any bubbles or break anyone's heart, but anyway, let me pour some more of this Celsius. Mm, okay. Who knows? It might be all sorts of bad for me. Chase it with some water. Anyway. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, the space program. Now, I propose in this book, and, uh, and I think also in Empire of the Will 3, which I don't have here, um, this FEMA group, FEMA, whatever, F-E-H-M-E, -E, this medieval era terror hand, okay, of what would become NIMSA, Um I think they were the, the operative NIMSA organization behind the JFK assassination, and I think we saw them raise their ugly heads again with the 1986 Challenger disaster. Why do I think that? I do think Challenger was a sabotage. Um, see, our space program was a legacy tied directly to John F. Kennedy, right? Particularly going to the moon. Um, through the turbulent 60s and 70s, you know, the social chaos, the Vietnam issue, um, all the political ups and downs. Um, the one thing by the time we got to the eighties that Americans had that, you know, uh, up to the time was not sullied, was not muddied, was our space program. It was the one last thing that all Americans could agree upon to be proud of our space program. Well, the neo-Nazi cons who slid in to the White House, okay, milieu, um, through the, attached onto the Reagan administration, through the, the neocon bushes, um, they had to establish, make their point, establish their presence. And from my perspective, sabotaging the challenger in particular 
was another psychological blow to the American people. You see, by the time we got to that, we, we had had a few years of Ronald Reagan, like him or not, America felt good about itself again. Okay. And the neo-Nazi cons can't have that. Okay. They just can't have that. And um, we had gone several years with space program successes, right? But here was a mission that had, for the first time, a civilian aboard, okay? A school teacher, right? Um, and that's just the kind of thing that's right up the alley of this FEMA, FEMA, FEMA group, okay? Um, so sabotaging that so that the world, you know, and Americans watching on TV could see the destruction of that shuttle and the certain deaths of the crew on board, including a civilian and one of their own, was just the kind of thing that the FEMA does. You know, um, uh, uh, optimum shock to the system. Um, I think the next thing they did to a uh, spirit breaking thing they did, of course, that they were involved with was 9-11. You've heard me talk about that before. Um, check out the book, um, Where Did the Towers Go? Uh, credited to Dr. Judy Wood. Um, check out that book if you've never seen it. Listen to what Joseph Farrell has to say about that book. Um, this was the biggest blow to the American psyche since World War II. Look, look where America is in the last um, 22 years since that. We have never recovered from it. The division that it, you know, it was the ax head that chopped into us and, and did that cleaving. And uh, that was fed further by the Bush II administration and the uh, the conflicts we were forced into and and some cases lied to about. And then, you know, as the, the political scene in America has continued, more divisive, more divisive, more divisive. Okay, because it's time to destroy the host. It's time to weaken the host and to the to the point of no recovery. I fear that. I think it could be too late for us as such. Um, I have had a perspective that um, it's the only, the, the one thing that might be able to survive this is the idea that um, the American ideal is portable. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a document, the Constitution, which does work when it's allowed to and not toyed with. Um, and any group of people could use a Constitution as a model and establish an America anywhere. Anywhere on the planet. Anywhere off the planet. The America that we have known for 200 and some years. I don't know if we can recover, if we'll, we'll ever recover. The American ideal, I mean, because, you know, I, I, I know there's the discussion about imperfections, imperfections. Look, no nation on this earth has ever been perfect, okay? No group of people on, on this planet in the history of humankind has ever been perfect, okay? And, um, without blame for something. But um, as far as the ideal of individuals having more freedom and opportunity than, you know, any other society has offered, you know, historically, um, that's really, I think, what we're supposed to be about. And of course, we've gotten away from that. You know, look, the folks who identify themselves as anarchists, they have a good point. <laughs> you know, 
people that are, you know, libertarians, you know, like with the small L, the leave me alone, go do your thing and leave me the hell alone. They have a good point. Um, because really that's, that's the idea. And, um, we, that's not what we have. Okay. Clearly we know that. And today is a direct result of what happened 60 years ago today. It was a coup. And, uh, how many minutes have I gone? Good Lord, 50 minutes. I talk about that in this book. As I've said, it, it should have a black cover because this is the most dark, depressing <laughs> for me to write um, of all my books. But uh, you can get that at walterbosley.com. And so there we, um, there we go on that. I've been going 50 minutes. I'm going to go ahead in the live chat and take questions now. So. I, I don't see any wrenches in here, so I hope everybody is behaving. By the way, I do go through and look at the live chat after the stream is over. And if I see shit in there that I don't like, not only do I cut it out, but I also block the person doing it, okay? Because as you guys know, I don't sit there and read the live stream while I'm rambling and doing my thing. I trust people are uh, behaving themselves. So... Solid asks, can you give a bit more info about Bama? Um, it, it, I gave the info that there is. It, it was this, this organization during the medieval Prussian era. Um, and that's exactly what they did, were political assassinations. Okay. Um, they were very secretive, of course, about who they were individually, but they were greatly feared. The, the other people in power you know, feared them enough to just, they refused to talk about them. They wouldn't go there. So, you know, beyond that, they're, they're a mystery, but I, I suggest that you, you know, you can read about what is known about them in this book, but also Paul Winkler in the thousand year conspiracy talks about them. So, Anyway, any more questions? I'm taking questions and comments directly about What I have shared here today. Any questions about the book? Uh, Michael, I'll let Malia answer that question for you. It was it was a good trip. It was a it was a very interesting trip. Some things were um, kind of. Uh, I learned some things that I'm not talking about right now because it has to, it, it carries my Empire of the Wheel research further. And I don't want to go public with that until I can fully flesh it out and write about, you know, uh, write about that. And so I don't want to say anything about it. But that was what I came away from with from that weekend. Nathan, that's the last. Walter was JFK's creation of the DIA, an attempt to. Rain in the paperclip security breach. Um, perhaps the problem was there was already too much influence of these uh, internationals in our military. Uh, one of them, you know, of course, that Nazi international. The other one, the um, the the communist international. 
So uh, it, it might have been, unfortunately, a wasted effort if he thought that uh, a DIA... I, I think my understanding is DIA was to have something so that he didn't have to go through the CIA. But unfortunately, military minds, high-ranking military minds, were already infected. Am I ever going to come to Ohio? If there's an event, or if my research leads me there, absolutely. Blacker81 asks that. Philip Blair, on the importance of being self-informed and understanding the narratives and all media, blah, 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 blah. Ben Franklin said, make of yourself a sheep and the wolves will eat you. Your thumb. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I would agree with, with Franklin. Here's, you know, here's one thing I do want to say, folks. We got a lot of people that, oh, it's not as bad as you say. Oh, it's not, you know, okay, whatever. Um, and then you have people that, you know, they, they talk tough and this, that, the other. But um, I think, you know, the coup happened. It's been 60 years. It has been 60 years. And there's certain damage that's already been done as a result of it. And, you know, my question to people is, what are you really going to do about it? You know, um, think about that. Ask yourself, what, what are you prepared to really do about this? Other than, you know, we can bitch about it in public, in a public forum, but... Don Fletcher says, thanks, Walter, for all your work, research, and sharing your thoughts. Sure, Don, thank you for being here. Okay. Um, save the, Hey, Steve, save that question for when we're, um, we're talking about Atlantis. Because that, that would be a good, uh, a good topic there. I, I, I was talking about the duplicity of, which is a little different than the duality, but. Like Rady One says, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Yeah, just like it's better to have a gun and not need it than to need a gun and not have it. Remember, folks, if you want me to address a question or a comment, please put it in all caps. Otherwise, I assume you're having a conversation amongst yourselves. So it's got to be in all caps. And remember, please, that I write books like this. I write books like this. I write books on... Juan Cabrillo, Sir Richard Francis Burton, Ambrose Bierce. I do not spend 24-7 watching the news and listening to every pundit and every podcaster uh, just ceaselessly getting into the inside baseball and into the weeds on the popular politics of the day. So if you ask me something that I don't recognize what you're talking about, I'm probably not going to address it. Why is that? Well, because we do have some people in this community who, um, quite frankly, have embraced some asshole points of view that I vehemently disagree with. And they use buzzwords and they slip their buzzwords into things like live chats to get guys like me to repeat those buzzwords. Okay. And these are things that, um, you know, I there's some popular neo-Nazi crap going around our community today that's being embraced, okay? And I find that ignorant to embrace that shit. But people are doing it, and I don't like to get dragged into it. So just FYI. Optic Racer. Hello, Walter. Do you think the bell went to South America or the United Both. Remember, the bell, it, it was a knowledge, okay? It was a technological knowledge. So I'm sure post-war 
um, Nazi and Nazi backed scientists um, in South America were pursuing the bell just as much as the United, I think the United States was. So I think both. Jim Gerard says they tried to squeeze 1,000 square pegs into one round hole on November 22nd, 1969. You could say that. It does kind of look like that. But again, look at, you know, who, who's the one suspect on the list in the JFK assassination who had connections to all the others. Okay. You only needed their peg to represent all the others. And that's the Nazi peg. Why was Challenger allowed to land? I don't recall Challenger landing with a damaged shell. The Challenger was the... I think you might be getting other shuttles mixed up. Challenger was the one that exploded on launch. Philip Blair... My grandpa, who almost died in the Battle of the Bulge, he kept a note card in his pocket with ugly facts, for example. How many Americans are being killed? Maybe in the current war. Yeah. Eminem Matthews asks, was that aimed at me? Uh, was what aimed at you? And why, you know, be specific. Flying Brian says, Walter, great shoes. It's great shoes. I have some great shoes on. They're very comfortable. <laughs> Walter, great show. Any news on the soup analysis? Not yet. I'm waiting to hear from Jeremy and company. Actually, I like this Celsius flavor. Thank you, Malia. This doesn't have the nasty tarine uh, tang to it. This one here. Okay. Alrighty. Any more questions? Any more comments? Nimza, how America sold its soul at walterbosley.com, and I get to the point with this one, folks. It's real quick. On the back here, it asks these questions. Nimza, who are they? Why are they here? What do they want? I, I, I try to answer that to the extent it can be answered in this book. Thank you, Optic Racer. Then remember, this weekend, Napoleon opens. Read my Napoleon book, walterbosley.com. And, of course, Malia and I will be doing a review um, as soon as we can after we see the film over this holiday weekend here in the United States. Why does... Why does the misuse of our military industrial complex bother me? Why does the thought that we have been involved with in, in any way uh, with, with any kind of unjust or superfluous war? It's because I am a military officer and, and um, reserve inactive. Um, I don't like to see our military personnel used that way. I don't like to see young American men and women being maimed or killed for goddamned industry. Okay? Now, I'm not naive. I know that commerce and trade have always been a factor in things. Okay? But, you know, if there's a tyrant trying to, you know, uh, cut off commerce and trade, um, that that is, okay, That that's a just cause. All right? But... To go to war just because it makes your military industrial complex money and is good for the economy, that's freaking evil. 
Um, and in order to get the people behind that and the soldiers, they lie to you. They tell you, oh, it's a just cause. Oh, this person's a bad guy. Oh, you got to go get them. That's an evil thing to do to manipulate soldiers that way. And I, I don't like to see that happen. I personally don't like the idea that, you know, um, one way or another, over my 20-year career, I was a part of more uh, uh, feeding and serving the goddamn military-industrial complex empire and not my country. Shame on me. But, you know, that's just me. Blacker81, we are working on getting audiobooks done um, as we speak. So that, that will happen in the coming year. I'm hoping to get Joshua Cutchin on soon. I'm waiting to hear if he's available next Wednesday, one week from today, the 29th of November, 2023 AD, according to the particular calendar that we uh, follow here in this world of ours. Um, hopefully we'll have, we'll have, uh, Eminem Matthews says, this is not a buzzword question. What's your question, Eminem Matthews? What is your question? I feel like I'm playing Jeopardy. <laughs> Right? Trebek, that's a nice looking jacket. Tell me, do they make it for men? It is Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving here in the USA. No, M&M. Um, I do not see your question. If you went beyond 200 characters, then you're going to have to retype it. Okay? So retype it. Keep it succinct. And, um, you know, I will do my best to answer it. Philip Blair asks, how about a Joshua Cutchin and Nick Redfern together for Walter Bosley Channel Extravaganza? That would be great. I've been working with Nick Redfern to have him on, by the way, folks. He's been having some connectivity issues. So he tells me as soon as he gets that cleared up, he's going to be able to schedule with me. So looking forward to that. Eminem Matthews, um, ask your question again, please. Don't, I'm not scrolling up. All right. Don't, this is, this is a, this is a game. I don't play here. Retype the question. Keep it succinct. Okay. It's that easy in the time that it takes you to keep typing. It's in the, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. You could just retype the question. Okay. Thank you. I've got people in there scrolling through and they don't see your question. If you go over 200 characters, it does not post. Just FYI. I'm just, you know, watching the chat, waiting for the next question. Let's see. Um, 
I've been um, developing a little short, fun little novel that I hope to come out with early next year. Um, I have one of my pulps that's uh, in progress that, uh, you know, C.W. Channer asks, what is a game you will play here? Well, maybe Shoots and Ladders, Candyland, you know, the easy stuff. <laughs> Philip Blair wants to know what I want for Christmas. Hmm. I'll let you know. Hey, Ari Babel is here. Our friend Ari. How you doing? How are you doing? I hope you're uh, having a decent Thanksgiving weekend. ML asks, off-topic question, and you guys know I usually don't like to acknowledge the off-topic stuff. However, this is an interesting one to me. So I, Walter Bosley, the Walter Bosley channel, That's this is my channel, so I can, I can do this. What do I think happened to flight... MH370, I think something much more mundane than we might have suspected. Uh, C.W. Channer asks, what is a NIMSA-related game you would play here? Nimzopoly. <laughs> is there, I mean, we, could, we should come up with a Nimzopoly. It's good news, Ari. Cooking today, for tomorrow, so far so good. Excellent. I know you'll have a good one. Okay, Nathan Etzel asks, could a McCarthy-style hearing break the hypnosis of the last 60 years? I See, I don't know. The problem we have with the hearings now is what do people do? They don't remember. They just don't answer the question. They blah, blah, blah over, you know, they, 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 um, what's the word? Um, what what what's the what's that word that's on the tip of my tongue where the congressmen go on and on and on and and don't stop? That's all they do, you know. So this is part of the problem that I'm talking about. E even our our system, our our hearings are not taken seriously. Filibuster. That's what they do. Is you know people brought before Congress just filibuster with their bullshit. Um. Ah, Eminem. Okay. YouTube is deleting my question when I use the name. That's probably because I do have certain blocked words because in the past I've had uh, trouble with troll assholes. And uh, those who have been here at the Walter Bosley channel and followed us long enough know that I have zero tolerance for troll bullshit. And um, so uh, ask your question within the context of the topic and try asking it without the particular name. Um, but, you know, just in case, if you are trying to slip them something true through, Jesus Christ, Walter, if you are trying to slip something through, you run the risk of being booted. So, you know, I'm not saying you are, but, you know, that's, that's my disclaimer that I have to do. Yes, Michael Dark, I think a Nimzopoly would be good. <laughs> CW Channer always suspected the mundane with the, with the MH370. And, and yeah, I, I, it was fun for a while, you know, before to try to figure out it was mysterious, I should say, not fun, but, uh, okay. Well, I'm sorry you give up Eminem, but, um, again, try to ask your question without using that particular name. Philip Blair says, people only listen to the hearing they expect to agree with them. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. We need some bipartisan leadership like when Frank Church worked with Bergo. Uh, yes. Um, we just need a new political class. Our political class is part of the, a huge part of the problem. Okay, The fact that we even have a political class should tell you something. So...
Michael Dark asks, has NIMS's ideology shifted over time to current day? Do you think its motivations have changed? Um, I think its general um, motivation, you know, this dominance thing, uh, advanced from global to um, off planet. Okay. I, I think that's the shift. And um, I think the NIMS of values became the um, imperial American values. Yeah, I do think that. Uh, if you embrace the idea of American empire, an imperial type you know, of America, you're basically embracing um, these uh, proto-Nazi ideas. It's fascistic. Joshua Hamilton says, strange, or maybe not so strange, how Germany seems to connect so many topics in the community. The author of Missing 411 has even connected German ancestry to that phenomenon. Well, I, you know what? I would say in, in that context, it's because um, German scientists have been so interested in pursuing, certain German scientists interested in pursuing um, the extraordinary in the last, let's say, 200 years. So I think that's one of the reasons that you see that. And I, I do find I'm one of those, Joshua, who's very curious about what Pilates, you know, that particular connection that David Pilates has found, that German connection to it. It, it is intriguing. Ari Bavel says, Nimzopoli, go to the moon, do not pass, go, do not collect $200. So, is Eminem still here? Is he going to try to pose his question? Um, did he take offense to um, when I was talking about, you know, the embrace of uh, Nazi ideas in the community? Because I'm not changing my position. I neither like Nazi ideas, nor do I like Marxist ideas. People are, of, of those, you know, I, <coughs> those ideas, just be aware that that's my position. Blacker81 asks, how comparable is January 6th to the Reichstag fire? Um, well, I think one was... It's very similar. In general, the, the answer to your question, it, it, it's very similar. It was, it was something that was bullshit that was spun up to spin people up to a particular narrative. So it's very comparable in that regard to the Reichstag fire. Philip Blair asks, says, strange question, but sincere question. Are we conditioned to desire accept sadomasochistic leadership? Uh, I don't, I think that um, I, I think I understand your question. Yeah, in our times, by now, after 9-11 and decades of our political class becoming such and doing things the way they've been doing, um, I think, yes, generally, the answer to your question is yes. You know, particularly people who still um, live by the two-party system that think that that's a legitimate thing, that they're going to get any progress, either being a Republican or a Democrat. Um uh, that's definitely conditioning. Eminem says he's trying. Okay. Keep trying, Eminem. D. Dorothy Papineau says, Walter's talk with Seshari a year ago addressed the 411 missing. Indeed it did. Indeed it did. Adonia says, you are lost if you believe the country 
secretly controlled by Nazis. Um, you're kind of blind if you don't see, you know, the Nazi. Um, oh, here we go. That one won't be on the. All the Nazi scientists brought my paper clip or technical answer. Uh, what makes you think, Chris, that I disagree with that statement? The so you're saying Nazis were the true German nationalists? I think there were people that believed in the that w believed in a German nation who weren't necessarily Nazis, but the scientists who came over through Operation Paperclip were damn well Nazis. It embarrassed the United States Air Force in particular when journalists were uncovering how Nazi these guys were. So, Chris, come on. Come on, Chris. Yes, they were Nazis. Most of them. Okay. That's gone. Um, I'm not getting into the uh, popular um, I don't even know what you'd call it. The popular narrative right now um, that was just brought up in the live chat there. Okay? Think what you want. Dion Williams thinks that the coup has already occurred. Yeah. Uh. Folks, just, you know, I want to I want to say it right here. If if you embrace um any kind of uh, sympathy for anything Nazi or, you know, uh, if, if you're embracing neo-Nazi attitudes and opinions, um, uh, you know, with, with the anti-Semitism thing, that's not welcome here. Okay. And think what you want about that, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be party to a bunch of neo-Nazi bullshit, not even in the live chat. Okay. So if, if that's where you're coming from, come from somewhere else. Michael Dark asks, do you think NIMSA at all have made a Faustian bargain that will be their ultimate demise? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. So basically what I was saying a moment ago, go troll somebody else's show. All right. And don't assume just because I have no tolerance for neo-Nazi sentiment bullshit in our community, that I'm necessarily on the side blindly of any particular nation out there you might be against. Okay? Um, because it might surprise you. But it doesn't mean it's coming from any kind of uh, neo-Nazi perspective. And don't fool yourself by saying, oh, well, I'm not neo-Nazi, but I do think this or I think that. Mm -mm.
Okay. Uh, Eminem Matthews, we've had this issue before. I don't know what's going on on your end, how you're typing it. If anybody else can see Eminem Matthews' question, um, please reword it or something. Um, because we've had this issue before. Um, if you can send it via private message to someone and then they can ask the question in a different way. But again, Eminem, if you're putting things in there that are buzzwords on certain things, um, YouTube can do that. Try to spell it phonetically. Uh, Drizzy Capone Corleone asks, Walter, do you think you can decipher the Nimza hieroglyph using Thenite or pre-Egyptian script? I don't know. I've never tried. I would have to familiarize myself with Thenite. There is, right there in the middle, underneath Colonel Samuel Tillman, is the um, Nimza hieroglyph of which Drizzy Capone Corleone speaks. <sighs> so... Yes, thank you, Modwiz. Yes, indeed. Um, they do block comments, and that doesn't mean it's stuff that I've put um, blocks on. And usually I only block something or someone when they've shown themselves to be a troll. I, I just don't have, you know... I don't have time for idiots. Philip Blair asked, do I have any fun November traditions? Flying Brian and I, every Thanksgiving evening, used to go to a double or triple feature, uh, very often at the Crest Cinema in San Bernardino. One of our great triple features that we... Yeah, this is six hours in the cinema, folks. Six hours on Thanksgiving evening. One year we saw Supergirl. Terrible movie. Night of the Comet. Not a bad movie. A fun one. And Purple Rain. All three of those. Triple feature. I trust you all are going into a good, fun holiday weekend. Dion Williams asks, Walter, it's, well, says, it's interesting how the NIMSA Nazi system has continued through generations, so it must go much deeper in history to see it continue through the generations. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I go into, folks. These three books. Okay, how uh, how it uh, emerges in the Empire of the Wheel mystery. Okay, and it does. And this, this, okay, when you, when you hear um, our friend Daniel List, our friend Dr. Joseph Farrell talk about the Nazi International and the post-World War II, the JFK coup, um, JFK assassination coup, the military industrial complex and all of that stuff leading up to today and the deep state and all that. Folks, this book gives you the history of what they're talking about. The medieval, going back to medieval times, going back to the fourth crusade, what they're talking about, what Daniel List and Joseph Farrell today are talking about, um, this is the history of. Okay. So you're going to want to read this book, walterbosley.com. I make it easy for you. And I also 
you know, show you how it ties to today. I even mentioned U.S. senators, U.S. congressmen, okay, who are likely influenced by whatever NIMSA is today. So... There we go. All righty. Well, um, let me see. You can get my time travel novel also at walterbosley.com. The Napoleon movie is open now. You want to read Esoteric Napoleon for the more complete Napoleon narrative, a more correct one than what you get from um, most history about Napoleon Bonaparte. And if you want to know what's going on with the, the, the Nazi JFK assassination coup, if you want to know what led to it, this gives you the history dating back to the Fourth Crusade, okay? The Fourth Crusade, medieval era, and the thread that leads right up to the JFK assassination coup. So, Ari Bavel asks, is Zechariah Sitchin a recommended author? Um, uh, Sitchin can be problematic, okay? So go into him knowing that. So, okay, folks. Any more questions? Did Eminem Matthews ever find a way to get his question to me? Because... Oh, here we go. Max W. Lytle asked, is NIMSA actively influential in any other countries now? Well, I would say definitely in South America. Um, but boy, they, they have a powerhouse here and have had one since World War II in the United States. This is the number one country that it's influential in, the United States. Okay? Particularly since Operation Paperclip, in my opinion. Particularly since... The JFK assassination. The United States, particularly our political class, folks, and our military industrial complex have been the playthings of both post war um, NIMSA, Nazis, um, and the, um, you know, at one time the uh, Marxists through the Soviet Union and, you know, what they are now. Okay, Eminem Matthews, um, I don't know what the issue is. Um, so I'll tell you what, you can, uh, private message me the question. But, um, I'll tell you what, I'll humor you for a moment. What is the general topic of your question? What does it fall under? Hey, Nick N, how are you? We're waiting for Eminem Matthews to 
let me know what the topic of his apparently difficult to post question is, you know, just, just what is the overarching subject of your question? Okay. The war in Afghanistan. Um, well, okay. The war in Afghanistan has gone on. Our presence went on way too long. I went there four times. Pretty sure four times. In the early years of it. Um, the war in Afghanistan is a perfect example of... Uh, serving the military industrial complex empire. D. Dorothy says, can I get Seshery's? Sesh doesn't have a world atlas. Do you mean the handprint of Atlas? Um, that is available at Lulu. I don't know. Um, So, Malia, are you telling me that YouTube blocks any comment about the war in Afghanistan? They can kiss my ass. I went there four times during that. Handprint of Atlas. Available. Wow. Sorry, Eminem. I, I didn't imagine that. Uh, wow. War in Afghanistan, war in Afghanistan, war in Afghanistan, war in Afghanistan. Suck on that, YouTube. Jesus. Eminem Matthews says his country's, a country's army was caught flying a flag. Hmm. I, I, Whatever particular instance you're talking about, unfortunately, I the, the roundabout way you have to word it. Um, I'll tell you what, um, maybe we can get you a email address that you can send your question to. Some of the stuff, you know, we all know it. Some of the stuff that YouTube will flag. In a way, I'm a veteran of that conflict. So, you know, YouTube can kiss my ass if they don't want me talking about it. So Seshery's Telurik map is not available. It's not published. His handprint of Atlas, which explains the map, um, is. Hmm. Okay. Well, folks, I think we exhausted the topic this evening. It's uh, been an hour and almost 40 minutes. I want to thank all of you. We had a pretty good audience tonight. Um, I hope you guys found this informative. Um, I always have a little anxiety when it's just me, cause I always think, Hmm, are they going to like what I'm talking about? Are they going to, you know, find what I'm saying interesting? Um, I tend to personally think the shows with guests, um, I assume they're more interesting to you, the viewer, but, um, I'm told otherwise. And the numbers indicate that, uh, that, uh, that is so that you guys have enjoyed this. And um, it's not a happy topic, um, but it's the topic of the day. And I chose this because I, I don't think people are really open to discussing anything else today. And that makes sense. I get it. So again, please check out my book, uh, NIMSA, How America Sold Its Soul. Um, and it's at walterbosley.com. And folks, this gives you the history going back to the medieval era, the history of what 
Joseph Farrell talks about when he talks about Nazi International, the history of what Daniel List talks about when he talks about the the neo-Nazis and the JFK Nazi assassination coup and the deep state, folks. This this is the real um, history, the historical perspective behind that. All right? So um, check it out, walterbosley.com, the NIMS of book, and you can get the other books there too. And again, um, when Malia and I have seen the Napoleon film, we'll come on and give a review of what we think. And um, in the meantime, all of you here in the States and elsewhere celebrating Thanksgiving, have a great Thanksgiving weekend. And um, I'm hoping to have Josh Cutchin on the next episode, waiting for that uh, final word. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. And uh, we'll see you next time.